regardless of changing fashions, and certainly a lot of the novelty material the Whiteman Orchestra played has fallen by the wayside, those scores, those scores having to do with Bix and, and the jazz thing, uh, I always felt were timeless, that they would sound good today as, as they must have sounded good in those days. And what a pity it was that the only thing we had, the only means we had uh, for hearing them was uh, records which, uh, while, while not badly recorded, certainly were not representative of what, what one could do today. So as part of last year's Camden Jazz Festival here in London, we handpicked a 28-piece orchestra uh, out of the finest musicians available here in Britain, uh, trying as closely as possible to approximate chair for chair, man for man, uh, the kind of skills that Whiteman's, Whiteman's musicians had. There's an obviously enormous labor of love involved in resurrecting these old charts and bringing together all these musicians. What did it feel like when you first heard the sounds of this ensemble? I'm not one to, you know, give an over, to overly uh, overt displays of emotion, but it just knocked me. I almost fell off my chair. It was just, you know, the sound was big and warm and lush, and there it was, you know, and I have to admit that I was knocked out. In bringing together the group of English musicians to reproduce the Whiteman Orchestra of the 20s, did you ask them to reproduce as well the solos of the various instrumentalists they were representing? No, absolutely not. In fact, quite the contrary. 
part and parcel of making this thing living music rather than just another great hits of type project, you know, uh, was the idea that where improvised solos were supposed to be taken, they would be taken as improvised solos. Uh, obviously, in doing this, you've got to find soloists who are reasonably true to the general idiom in which the, the original music was played. Uh, I suppose my own task was the hardest of all in that uh, you can't help be aware of Bix, not only, uh, you know, the, the sound that he made, but the fact that, I mean, these arrangements were built around his musical personality. And so, sure, uh, what I play is going to come out sounding very much in the Bix idiom, but I certainly hope that uh, the fact that they're my notes and my figures uh, and not his, and not an attempt to imitate his, uh, is something that, that, that uh, you know, comes home to people who hear the band. How about the vocals with the group? Well, we're very fortunate in, in at least one particular, in that we have Chris Ellis, who, again, uh, is a walking encyclopedia of music of the era and, and has managed to absorb the period flavor without consciously trying to imitate Bing Crosby. Well, Taint So was a problem when Whiteman recorded it because it begins uh, with Bing Crosby, in that case, and here in, in, in this case with Chris Ellis, uh, singing the first note right out of the blue. And at that time, uh, they had a lot of trouble recording it. I think it took them something like, like 12 takes to get it and get it right. Uh, we did it in slightly fewer than that, uh, mainly because somebody had the bright idea to come up with a tuning fork. And since it opens in the key of A, somebody just ponged the tuning fork with A, Chris heard the pitch, and off we went. Say, people, you should come to Arkansas. Meet a friend of mine, old Aunt Phoebe Law. She's known to everyone for miles around. She will help you when friends forsake you and trouble spare you down. For those who come her way are blessed when they hear her say, Taint so, honey, taint so. Spoke to the Lord and the Lord said, No, taint so, honey, taint so. Taint so, honey, taint so. Tomorrow will bring something good, I know, taint so. I mean, it just ain't so. Makes no difference what your problem may be. Just look up, brother, and I'm sure you will see. Taint so, honey, taint so. The devil said yes, but the Lord said no. Taint so, honey, taint so. There's no conflict in your own mind between the kind of music that we've always associated with Bix, that's basically an improvising jazz musician, and the kind of relatively sentimental music, I think one could say, 
and certainly highly organized music of white men. You never seem to conflict at all. Not at all. You know, uh, it's been said, I suppose, millions of times, and, and bears saying again, that there are only really two kinds of music, and that's good and bad. Uh, unfortunately, alas, for the historians and the record collectors and the rest, jazz didn't develop isolated from or apart from uh, vaudeville and music hall music and, and uh, show business in, business in general and entertainment in general. So as a result, I don't see that great a disparity between, uh, let's say, a, a six-piece Dixieland combo playing at the jazz band ball and, uh, on the other hand, Bix sitting in the middle of Whiteman's uh, brass section playing Dardanella. Uh, he's the same man. He's playing within a different frame of reference, a different context but he is still playing with a basic integrity. I mean, bear in mind that contrary to being stifled and stunted and, and, and you know, otherwise uh, restricted by the conditions under which he played with Whiteman, uh, he viewed his membership of that orchestra as the, not only the pinnacle of his musical career, but of musical achievement in the popular music profession. Uh, he was surrounded by men who were the finest virtuosi of their day on their instruments. There are two band numbers that we've not talked about yet. Uh, first of all, I found a new baby. Well, I found a new baby is another one of those arrangements which was not recorded during the 20s. I'm not quite sure why it wasn't recorded, because it was very short and would have fit very well within the structure of, of a 78 RPM record. It's arranged by Lenny Hayton uh, and has, as a point of novelty, really, a couple of things. First of all, it, it begins with Bix, uh, setting out the melody and all. and. Uh, at the end, it has what we, what we call a radio coda, after the thing kind of tapers off in a fade. Uh, obviously, during the 20s, uh, fades weren't in. So that this, this, the band comes whomping back with this, with this fully scored, lush coda, which has nothing to do with the arrangement or the tune or anything, but just really says in, in brief, OK, folks, it's over now. And I, as such, it, it, it can give you a bit of a giggle. Mm -hmm. 